All righty. And we I believe on starting, starting on time and ending on time. And tonight, um, we are pleased as part of SOLID to have uh, Mary Badger, who is uh, an ACOI member and a fellow of the American College of Osteopathic Internists, as well as the Academy of Wilderness Medicine. And we've had a number of people request more information about wilderness medicine, so we found the expert. Uh, she's received the U.S. Public Health Service to, uh, Distinguished Service Award for her work in the Navajo uh, Indians before practicing in Spokane. Uh, she's retired from Kaiser Permanente. She's involved as a volunteer in the Medical Reserve Corps, and including the COVID response team. And she's been very active in lecturing in climate change and health. She, in fact, is the current chair of the ACOI Climate and Health Committee. So, uh, Dr. Badger, we welcome you to SOLID, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Well, today's topic is wilderness medicine and first aid for internists. And when I was first asked to give this talk, it was a little confusing to me because looking at all the other topics, this seemed to be a bit of an outlier. So uh, for some reason that slide didn't advance. Let's try this, there we go. Uh, so I came up with three main reasons why this topic is probably uh, worthwhile to uh, do with the solid lectures. The first is that uh, more of you are now headed out into nature for both mental and physical well-being, and uh, preparation and in injury prevention are key. And in fact, while you're out there, you may ask, be asked to uh, lead medical care in the event of somebody being uh, ill or being injured. Also, as internists, it's important to know that by 2060, the number of older Americans is expected to double. And uh, over the last couple of years since COVID, about 12% more people over age 65 are heading outdoors for recreation. And it's important to realize that they have different wilderness first aid needs uh, due to less muscle and body tone, limited agility, and more susceptibility to different toxins, heat, cold, smoke, and disasters. Also, because they're doing more uh, adventure travel, they may be coming into clinic or office to ask for medical clearance or for advice in how to train for these various activities. And lastly, the wilderness is really coming to us even in urban environments in the form of natural disasters, floods, fires, and uh, heat events, even in the inner city. So it's important that since we might suddenly be practicing in an austere environment or a humanitarian crisis, that wilderness first aid skills um, might come in handy to do this. It's important to note that this is not a wilderness medicine course, although I will at the end be giving you all some places uh, where to get more definitive training. I will talk a bit about how city and wilderness first aid differ, some basic principles that can be used, a couple of different common issues uh, in all ages, but especially geriatric, some opportunities for the use of OMT, and uh, finally, how uh, wilderness and disaster medical skills overlap. So what is wilderness first aid? It's the immediate care given to a suddenly injured or ill person in the wilderness and the provision of that assistance until either more advanced level of care is available or recovery occurs. It is not a replacement for definitive medical care. I would like to begin with a true life scenario and I want you to keep thinking about this patient as we go through the slides and then we'll follow up with her final disposition at the end. So Sharon is a 64-year-old female who accompanied a group of Washingtonians up to Canada to do a backpacking trip. Uh, this involved driving about 30 miles on a terrible road and then backpacking in 12 miles to a uh, primitive cabin in the wilderness. And the plan was to do 10 days of day hikes using that cabin as a uh, base camp. Unfortunately, on about day seven at five in the morning, we heard a cry and a large crash as Sharon fell while she was descending from her uh, upper bunk, which was about six feet up, uh, to go out to use the outhouse. She fell, striking her head and her uh, 
back and uh, posterior chest on a piece of furniture on the way down. And when we got to her, she was complaining of pain in her uh, back and flank, as well as bleeding from her scalp, which she attributed to the fact that she was taking Coumadin. So what are the differences between city and wilderness first aid? There are several. The first is time to definitive care. And this largely depends on what you're doing and how uh, remote a location you're in. This in turn depends somewhat on the environment. Are you on the ground or below ground? Are you on the water or underwater? What's the temperature? What time of year is it? Is it winter or summer? What's the temperature? Do you have to worry about tides? When is sunrise? When is sunset? All of these things will have to be dealt with when you think about the fact that you have limited resources, both in terms of equipment and in terms of manpower and the skill sets that those people might have. Also, communication can be a big issue. There's a lot of places that cell phones don't work or even that um, uh, PLBs, personal locator beacons, or things like spot or in reach don't work properly or in certain countries where they're not allowed because they limit GPS use. All of these things then will contribute to the fact that you need to be able to improvise. You also need to remember that both the victims and the rescuers or first aid givers could be at risk for increased injury and illness under these circumstances. And even though definitive care has been called for, it still may be hours or days till somebody can get to you to help you out. And so it behooves you to have a plan uh, to maybe uh, set up a shelter depending on where you are. Some injuries and illnesses are also more common in austere locations. And also keep in mind that difficult decisions must be made uh, in terms of triaging certain patients and in terms of the fact that you may have to drastically alter your trip in order to take care of whoever it is you're taking care of. Also keep in mind that older wilderness travelers have physiologic changes that can impact their ability to deal with a wilderness issue. These include things like decreased cardiac output, decreased in age-predicted maximum heart rate, decreased VO2 max, increased incidences of coronary disease, decreased muscle mass and loss of muscle power and endurance, declines in cognitive function, slower reaction times, trouble with increased risk of falls, and they're often on medications like our patients' Coumadin that complicate our treatment. There have been a number of recent studies that suggest that the number of injuries is greater in the 50 plus year old group. And those injuries are associated with a higher risk of death. And it's interesting that over 50 is the only age bracket for which the number of search and rescue interventions has increased yearly for the last 10 years. A lot of these problems have to do with more rock climbing, tender shoulder and hand injuries heat-related illness, and exacerbations of chronic diseases. Also, they're more likely to get infection or have immunization issues. When I uh, set up these slides, uh, the recent Annals of Internal Medican Medicine uh, article on travel medicine uh, recommendations was not out yet, but I would highly recommend looking at that in terms of uh, infections and immunizations. So we all worry about uncovering some big disastrous event in the wilderness and, oh my God, we're internists, how are we going to deal with that? But in fact, most of what you need to treat are heat and cold injuries, wounds, orthopedic issues, GI issues, and exacerbations of chronic problems. But although extreme events are rare, you still need to be able to deal with them. But in fact, dealing with both sets of injuries, the basic approach doesn't really differ. And I tell people, remember SIDO, S for safety, I for initial evaluation, D for detailed evaluation, and O for ongoing treatment and reevaluation. 
So when you talk about patient assessment, the first thing you need to do in the wilderness is assess the scene for safety because you don't wanna be causing more victims. Physical dangers like rockfall, avalanche, wildlife and tides need to be considered. Altitude, whether there's lightning, what the temperature is, even whether there are other people in, around that can cause trouble, such as mountain bikers screaming down the trail, climbers above, hunters, ATVs or snowmobiles that are out there. So you need to give thought to that, but also how you're going to keep the scene safe. So for example, if you're on a downhill trail, maybe sending part of your party uphill to warn people that are coming down, hey, there's something going on down here, slow up a bit. Also think about, do you need to move the patient? And if so, to where and how? And is it safe for you in terms of body fluids? The other thing in the wilderness that you need to think about that you don't necessarily in the city is who needs help first. And this should be part of your scene survey because if there are multiple victims, unlike in the city where you would do uh, ACLS pro protocol, in the wilderness, you follow ATLS or Advanced Trauma Life Support, Advanced Wilderness Life Support Protocol, which says that if they don't have a pulse and they're not breathing, they're dead, and you need to move on and treat the living first. The opposite is true, however, in patients that have been struck by lightning, and we'll talk a little bit about that later on. So once you've assessed the scene, you need to approach the patient safely, identify yourself, get permission to treat. And one of the things you should probably do is ask their name and what happened, because this not only happens, assess the mechanism of injury or MOI, but it also helps figure out how alert and oriented they are, or if they only respond to verbal, painful, or they're unresponsive. The next thing you do then in these patients is what we call the MARCH protocol as primary survey. Uh, M for massive hemorrhage evaluation and management. And this is pretty unlikely in most wilderness situations. Airway and cervical spine stabilization and assure that it's maintainable. Respiration quality. And this is not very much change from what you would do in a hospital situation. If you can't breathe the way the patient's breathing, then something's wrong with their respiration and what their circulation is doing. You already know they have a pulse, but what kind of blood pressure they have may uh, be easily determined by, for example, if they have a radial pulse, they're probably 80 systolic. If they have a femoral pulse, they're probably 70 systolic. If they only have a carotid pulse, they're down in the 60 systolic range. And then H, uh, for a number of different things, are they hyper or hypothermic? Do they have a head injury? And start at this point thinking about, do you need to hike out or helicopter out the patient? This is important depending where you are. For example, a lot of the West Coast trails, Vancouver Island, Washington State, Oregon, California's Lost Coast Trail, there are some places where you just can't be during high tide. And so you need to think about if you've got a secchi disc telling you to climb a rope or a, a big ladder system to go up, this is not the place you wanna bring an unstable patient. You may need to actually backtrack on a trail to get them out safely. I mentioned H is for head injury. One of the things you need to think about are red flags. If somebody has a head injury, do they also have a structural brain injury? And some of the red flags for this type of patient are things like prolonged loss of consciousness, persistent Glasgow, Glasgow coma scale of less than 13, their age, whether they're on an anticoagulation medication or have a clotting disorder, whether they're drunk or drugged up, whether they've got new onset seizures, persistent vomiting, uh, how high an energy mechanism was involved in their injury, and whether their symptoms are worsening with time. Now, our particular patient, age of 63, on Coumadin, confused with a Glasgow coma scale of 14, certainly will bear watching and probable expeditious treatment in view of her head injury. 
On the other hand, we've got this 25-year-old kayaker that, don't ask me why, decided to go over Palouse Falls, which is 189 feet, so that he could break the world record for doing this. Amazingly, there were no injuries, but needless to say, I was quite happy he had his own medical team at the scene taking care of that situation. The other thing you need to consider in these patients are whether there's a significant head injury, there might also be a cervical spine injury. Signs and symptoms to assess would be bony tenderness, weakness, other signs of significant trauma, things like alcohol and drug use that skew their ability to give you an idea of what's happening or if they're unconscious. In these cases, using the nexus criteria, which is uh, uh, used in a number of trauma indications to see if you need uh, imaging, can also be used in these sort of situations. So if there's no loss of consciousness, cervical tenderness, painful distracting injury, or neurologic deficits, nexus is probably negative. Also, if there's less than a three meter or 9.8 foot fall, as it was the case in our particular patient. C-spine injury treatment in the wilderness has changed over the years. It used to be that uh, you had to do inline traction, C-spine uh, treatment, prevent movement at all by doing a uh, uh, rigid backboard for the C-spine, rigid backboard for the back. Now, basically, as long as you can minimize the risk of unstable injury, a soft C collar is recommended along with restriction and not immobilization, which uh, make it a lot easier to uh, transport this kind of patient. So once you've done that primary survey and uh, taken care of those issues, the next thing to do is your secondary history and physical. This should be flexible. Obviously, if somebody sprained their ankle or cut their finger, you're not going to go through uh, all this rigmarole. But abbreviated medical history, sample signs and symptoms, allergies, medications, past medical surgical history, when their last meal was, and events causing the injury could be important. If they're not responsive, you can look for clues. Do they have a medical alert tag, a list of medications in their wallet, meds or a glucometer in their pack or their tent, info on their cell phone, or they might be wearing a road ID if they're a cyclist, and what's going on in the local environment. Pain is also important to think about. Um, and again, uh, this should be part of the uh, history and physical. And keep in mind, you can do both of these at the same time. Potential areas of major bleeding also need to be considered depending on the mechanism of injury. Uh, and uh, you need to think about uh, what's going on in their chest, abdomen, renal problems, thigh issues with deformity, swelling, or tenderness, and uh, what's going on with their skin. Physical should include look, listen, feel, and don't forget smell. They may smell ketotic. They might uh, smell like alcohol. Um, you basically work your way down in a physical looking for signs of trauma. Now, in our particular case, uh, she had blood from her scalp. She had chest tenderness and um, uh, posterior thorax tenderness. Um, and uh, she had some uh, bleeding from her scalp. The other thing to think about is altered mental status. And a good uh, way to remember this, uh, both in the hospital and the clinic and out in the field, is what's called A-E-I-O-U tips. And uh, you go through this list and think about uh, ruling in or out each of these issues. Now I'm going to leave our original patient for a minute and talk about a different patient. This was on a trip to Escalante Canyon, Utah, a uh, backpacking trip. Um, it was uh, scheduled to be uh, a long trip and about uh, seven days in of a 10-day trip, 
patients started having uh, word finding issues and um, a question arose as to whether they were having uh, TIAs. It turned out they had had a history of similar problems about three weeks prior, had an MRI, which was negative, but they were uh, uh, scheduled for some additional studies, including um, uh, echocardiogram and uh, carotid dopplers, and they had put those off so that they could come on this trip, but didn't bother to tell anybody. Examination um, was negative. Uh, they were uh, diabetic, but sugar was normal. Um, and uh, physical exam was otherwise unremarkable, except for this uh, TIA type uh, symptoms that they were having. So we ended up having to uh, bail out to a car that was uh, seven days into the trip rather than going all the way to the 10 day marker, uh, got the patient out to further evaluation and it ended up, they ended up having uh, bilateral carotid endarterectomies down the line. So moving back to other problems that you might have to deal with in the wilderness, these are much more common than the trauma type things we've talked about already. Uh, more and more likely we're having issues with climate change causing physiologic effects of heat. Um, and uh, this is important to pay attention to um, not only what the uh, temperature is doing outside, but what the humidity is because this can change how the body needs to respond. Uh, for example, 55% uh, humidity, 100 degrees Fahrenheit is the same as 124 in the shade. But unfortunately, when they did all these studies, they didn't uh, think about what would happen in the sun. So you need to add another 15 degrees to that. And that can put people in extreme danger when they're out there. The internal medicine patient in the wilderness can be at increased risk uh, due to age over 65, people that are overweight, people that already have thyroid disease, diabetes, heart disease, neurologic issues, previous history of health of heat illness, and if they're on certain medications like diuretics or beta blockers, antihistamines, psychiatric meds, Parkinson's meds, et cetera. In the last 20 years, there's been about a 54% increase in heat-related mortality above in people that are above 65 years old. And so uh, very important to take note of this, especially in view of climate change. There are a number of clinical manifestations of heat injury. Uh, the first three on this slide can be uh, treated and then the trip can continue, but heat stroke is a whole different uh, scenario. So heat cramps often happen when salt and water are replaced by water alone. Uh, patients would present with cramping, especially in unilateral calves, and can be treated with rest and oral salt. Heat syncope can happen uh, from volume depletion, usually in people that aren't uh, acclimated to the heat. You can treat by uh, basically having them supine, moving to a cool area and drinking fluids. Heat exhaustion occurs um, and they become more tachycardic, lightheaded, but their mental status is normal and they're still able to sweat. So you can cool these people down, uh, hydrate them up, and in um, two to four hours, they'll probably be okay to continue on as long as they don't get too hot again. Heat stroke, however, uh, CNS changes are the key. Uh, they're not sweating. And a taxi is often the first thing you see. And these people need to be cooled as rapidly as possible and also evacuated to a hospital. On the opposite end of the coin for this is hypothermia. And uh, we don't usually carry hypothermia thermometers in the wilderness, so you need to go by other things. And keep in mind that temperature outside does not need to be below freezing for this to be an issue. Prevention's the key, and um, 
you need to be able to remove the patient from the situation that caused it. And also, if you're dealing with some other medical emergency in the wilderness, remember that people need to be protected from the ground because they lose heat. Cotton is rotten, so uh, probably best not to wear cotton in the wilderness. How to care for these types of people uh, sort of depends on what the, their status is under the circumstances. If they're cold stressed and they're not hypothermic, they just need to warm up, reduce the heat loss by adding clothing, uh, get them to move around some, provide high calorie food or drink. Uh, a lot of cavers uh, carry a bag and a candle to warm up with. Uh, you can uh, be sure though to put a hole in the top so that CO2 can escape. Um, as people become more hypothermic, they need to be treated more and more gently. You might consider uh, a hypothermia wrap or a burrito, but this would involve having things to uh, wrap them in. Blisters are something uh, that all uh, hikers and backpackers have to deal with over time. Uh, most can trick is to just cut donut out and put it on there. Remember, treat hot spots early so you don't end up with more trouble. Wounds are one of the more common injuries, and uh, evaluation should include the type of wound it is, the location where it is, the size of it, the severity of contamination, any bone, tendon, nerve, vascular involvement, and time since the injury. Also, treatment is to control the bleeding, evaluate distal function, clean the wound, dress and bandage, and monitor for infection. Also, there are some cases like this dog bite that I got on a bicycle ride where you need to consider whether the uh, animal has been uh, vaccinated for rabies and address that accordingly. Hemostasis is the first line of therapy in these cases. Uh, direct pressure usually controls the bleeding from most wounds. Scalp wounds, keep in mind, can require pressure for 30 minutes because they bleed more. Second line therapy, if none of this works, is to keep adding and adding and adding dressings. But if you're not making any progress after about 10 minutes or so, you can use something like Sealox or Quick Clot, which you can buy in the pharmacy or at Walmart, and that will help clot. Uh, it's important, we used to use pressure points long ago when I first trained, but those are no longer recommended. Third line therapy would be a tourniquet. And um, I'm not gonna get into that. You can do online courses in Stop the Bleed and uh, Tourniquet. Uh, uh, use, but keep in mind that if you do need a tourniquet, you need to put a T on the patient's uh, forehead and what time it was placed because there is a time limit on uh, how long these can be uh, left on before you start to worry about loss of limb in the future. You may need to irrigate a wound, and if you uh, need to do that, uh, you can use uh, water bottles, you can use uh, uh, baggies with uh, uh, pressure to irrigate those wounds. Closure is debatable. Uh, there's no real cosmetic difference between primary and secondary closure, but uh, sometimes this will just help if you're a long way from help and uh, you need to keep hiking to get out of where you are. Steri strips, strips are a good method, but you don't have to necessarily carry those along. Duct tape works well, but remember you need to poke little pinholes in it. And uh, you can also buy for about $40 something called Zip Stitch, uh, which works great, but it's an expensive thing to add to your first aid kit. Another trick that I've used in the backcountry on scalp lacerations is to put a piece of uh, uh, thread or uh, dental floss or something alongside the wound, and then to actually crisscross the hairs on a scalp, have somebody tie a square knot in uh, the dental floss or whatever you're using there, and then clip that. And you can use that all the way up the line without having to put stitches in somebody. There are a number of indications for antibiotic prophylaxis um, in the wilderness and uh, 
basically, I usually carry some uh, Augmentin and some Cipro along just in case. Burns needed to be addressed uh, as well with cooling, dressing, pain control, assessing the depth and the extent, and to decide whether wherever this is is usable or not usable and whether to stay or evacuate. In the ER, you'd use the rule of nines. In the backcountry, it's just easier to use the rule of palms. The idea being that a patient's palm is about 1% surface area. And so a full thickness burn over 1% or partial thickness burn over 10% needs to be evacuated, as do burns involving the face, hands, feet, genitals, or smoke inhalation. Keep in mind, prevention, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Let people know if you're lighting a stove or a uh, campfire, and remember not to cook in your tent. In terms of musculoskeletal injuries, soft tissue complaints constitute about 50% of all injuries in the wild. And so there is a good place here for osteopathic treatment. There's a great article uh, in Wilderness Environmental Medicine Journal in 2021, uh, which I've got uh, documented here on the slide, uh, talking about how to do this in uh, plantar fasciitis, trapezial spasm, headache, and lumbar spasm. And I would just refer you to that article because it's a great article. Orthopedic injuries often occur. Usually these are sprains or strains and can be treated with rest and uh, cold water from a stream, compression and elevation, and can continue onward. If you suspect a fracture, remember to immobilize the entire extremity, the joint above and the joint below the place of injury. Remember to check for peripheral pulses, capillary refills, and neuroassessment and to warn the patient to let you know if anything starts to tingle or feel odd. One of the best investments I think you can make in terms of wilderness medicine is a SAM splint um, because they can be used in all kinds of uh, splinting uh, situ situations. They only run about 15 or $20. Otherwise, you'll have to create your own splint. Remember, big, ugly, fat, and fluffy is a good way to go to avoid further injury. But you can certainly uh, make do with a number of improvised splints, but probably a good idea to think about how you do this ahead of time. Ortho emergencies would be an open fracture. And so you need to treat the bleeding, clean the wound, cover the wound, and splint the wound. Whether to reduce it or not pretty much depends on your uh, level of comfort for doing something like this. And evacuation in these cases are key. The pulseless extremity is a big deal. This is often a board question. Uh, the five Ps are pain, pallor, pulselessness, paresthesia, and paralysis in these types of patients. Dislocations is one thing that I would say when you're doing your orthopedic rotation, have somebody show you how to dis, uh, treat a dislocated shoulder. Because if you're trying to walk somebody out of the wilderness and their arm is kind of up here because they can't... Uh, a deduct it, then uh, that's a lot harder to get them out and it's a lot more painful. If you can do a uh, shoulder uh, relocation technique, uh, that makes them more comfortable and it's a lot easier to get them out of the wilderness. I personally prefer the snowbird uh, maneuver just because I don't have a lot of arm strength and uh, using that, you can use some of your uh, leg strength to uh, help reposition the shoulder. Moving on, we need to think about uh, altitude illness. The importance here is that you don't need to be up on Everest like my friend Jonathan here in order to get altitude illness. It can happen over 6,500 feet. So if you're thinking about flying to Denver and then driving up to uh, one of the ski resorts, might be a good idea to stay in Denver overnight and then move up. Um, often if you're doing uh, backpacks like on the Continental Divide in Colorado, if you can uh, hike high and sleep lower, this will help prevent problems, but the key is the rate of ascent. Uh, problems that occur after acute mountain system sickness are high altitude cerebral edema, which can often present a headache or ataxia, altered loss of consciousness, 
and HAPE, which is high altitude pulmonary edema, uh, which can cause death in uh, 24 hours. So it's important to note that seniors are actually not at more risk according to uh, recent studies, but anybody who has previously had HAPE, this is 60% more likely to occur and you can have it, not have it, not have it, and then have it severely again. So it's important to notice that. Definitive treatment in these cases is always dissent. Meds are an adjunct. There uh, was um, a redo of uh, wilderness medicine guidelines for treatment of altitude illness. Uh, when I sent my slides in, it was in press, but it's since come out. And it's a great article um, in the uh, Wilderness Medicine magazine. It's uh, open. Uh, so you can just Google uh, altitude illness treatment and it'll pop up. But they've got the new guidelines, everything from uh, prevention to uh, treatment. And it's a great article that you should look at. Seniors at altitude um, is becoming a bigger issue because patients now are traveling to Machu Picchu or they're going skiing over in the Alps. And pre-trip evaluation needs to evaluate uh, and address four different issues whether they've got already got hypoxemia or impaired oxygen delivery, whether they're at risk for ventilatory response issues, pulmonary vascular response issues, or they have underlying conditions like sickle cell, coronary artery disease, et cetera. Uh, there's also a great article in New England Journal, which I've cited here on this topic, but a lot of people just prefer to send somebody to a pulmonary medicine person or somebody that does a lot of climbing that's a physician that would have a good idea on further evaluation for these patients. Lightning can be a special problem. And I already mentioned uh, the possibility of uh, how you need to reverse triage these people. I would like to say I did not put this picture uh, in here and hopefully the people that posted that online uh, photoshopped it. Uh, because lightning kills about 24,000 people worldwide annually, uh, and even 10 times more are likely to survive a strike. Most dangerous times are in the afternoon, right before a storm appears overhead, or after a storm has passed. And it can, keep in mind, strike 10 miles in front of a storm or over a ridge line. One of the um, Things that can occur most frequently is from ground current. It strikes the ground first, transfers through the ground, and then hits the patient that's hit. Can cause respiratory or cardiac arrest, burns, all kinds of other issues. Often appearing on boards is this picture of a lightning strike called the Lichtenberg pattern. And so take a look at that. And when it appears on boards, you won't be surprised. Initial triage, as I mentioned, is reverse triage because in these people, if they're struck by lightning, often you can uh, do CPR and they recover relatively quickly. And then you can move on to uh, uh, treat the people that did not have CP arrest uh, in order to stabilize their other issues. Also, if you're on a ridge and you suspect lightning is going to be a problem, uh, get off the ridge and assume the lightning position. Put your feet together. This can significantly reduce ground current problems, which cause about half lightning fatalities. Crouch if you can to decrease uh, issues and don't touch things like your metal hiking poles. One of the scariest places I've ever been, and I've hiked and backpacked all over the world, was on clouds rest in Yosemite, beautiful bluebird day, 10 o'clock in the morning. And all of a sudden, all our hair started to rise up. We got off the ridge, uh, lightning started to bounce around and luckily uh, nobody had any issues. So I've talked about evacuation several times. Keep in mind when you're doing evacuation, you need to consider the greatest good for the greatest number. Is it even needed at all? Maybe somebody's trivially injured and able to continue once you uh, fix whatever's going on. Can they continue after a rest day? Are they in need of a physician's care, but not immediately, like our TIA patient? Are they critically injured, or are they dead and you need to leave them for retrieval later on? The big question is, do you go for help or do you do it yourself? And for the most part, you're going to either 
call for help using something like a spot or inreach or PLB, or you're going to go for help. If you have to go for help yourself, remember, send three people. One person is injured, then one person can stay with them, and the other person goes for help for two different groups. Uh, remember, you need to care for the victim and the people that are remaining and think about whether this means you need to set up a shelter till evacuation crew gets in there. Think about how fast evacuation is needed. Are there skilled personnel that are needed? What kind of terrain you're in? Well, it's going to be dark. What kind of impending weather is going on? And do you have the skills to even make a litter and enough people to carry a litter? Most people think, oh, I'll just make a litter and carry the person out. Well, it takes two to three groups of six to successfully evacuate somebody on stretcher from the wilderness. There are certain medical problems in the wilderness that need to be evacuated. Cardiac problems, unstable angina, MI, heart failure. Meanwhile, rest and aspirin. Also keep in mind if you can decrease the exposure to cold or decrease the elevation where they are, uh, that will help. Respiratory problems, severe exacerbations of COPD and asthma. Keep in mind that sometimes inhalers don't work at high altitude. Pneumonia, you can start the antibiotics and evacuate. Pulmonary emboli, consider aspirin and evacuate. Neurologic, we already talked about the TIA symptoms. If patients having new seizures or status epilepticus, they should be evaluated. One seizure in a patient that's normally controlled uh, may be able to be uh, treated and then carry on uh, depending on what the situation is. Refractory or recurrent hypoglycemia probably needs evacuated one time. You might be able to treat and keep on going. Ketoacidosis is an issue. Abdominal pain in a pregnant person, inability to eat, drink, or blood in uh, vomit or feces, or pain lasting, lasting severely over 24 hours needs to be evacuated. I did mention that there's overlap of wilderness and disaster medicine because both fields obviously stress improvisation and decision making with limited information. And uh, often need to distribute scarce resources. Uh, disasters uh, could be considered austere environments and uh, have similar resource allocation challenges. For example, during Hurricane Sandy, a lot of ERs were flooded and nobody could uh, use those. Um, recent fires on Maui uh, demolished a couple of health clinics and damaged a hospital. The same was true fires a couple of years ago in California. So you may be uh, using your wilderness medicine skills uh, when you don't really mean to. I'm going to put this slide up, but not really discuss it in detail because everybody's uh, uh, fear level and uh, preparation levels are somewhat different. You need to be able to plan for the worst. What I take on a backpack or a hiking trip may differ from when I go kayaking, and that's certainly different from when I ride my uh, uh, bike on uh, back roads, but not doing mountain biking. Uh, think about what essentials you need for what you're doing and what improvisational things you might need. I personally always carry duct tape and parachute cord because those are the two things I can't make in the wilderness. You also need to uh, keep in mind that you need to, um, if you want more training in this, there are a number of different places you can get this. I would highly advise taking an advanced wilderness life support course. You can do that through Wilderness Medical Society, Knowles, Outward Bound, a couple of different medical schools offer it, or there's a group in Colorado called Wilderness Medical Outfitters that provide such training. Also, there's electives for those of you that are uh, MS3 or MS4. Uh, if you uh, Google the Wilderness Medical Society and look for electives, those are usually month-long electives. They fill fast. The uh, uh, thing for uh, this coming uh, February was filled by uh, September. 
Uh, but uh, some of these are run by a combination of both MD and DO groups. Uh, there are also scholarships for uh, wilderness medicine conferences, if you want to go for those, and they have uh, those both summer and winter conferences. If you're in the military, I think probably now they're requiring you to do tactical casualty emergency care, but there's also civilian versions that are being offered uh, here and there. There's a group called Austere Care that uh, does a uh, month or uh, more uh, classes out in the wilderness in austere environments. And there's, of course, specific courses for divers, cavers, and even now for uh, astronauts, if you're so inclined. So what about our original patient? Safety was okay, but a storm was coming in in less than eight hours, which could limit our evacuation choices. Remember, the hike out was 12 miles, then a forest service road for 30 miles, and sunset was happening at 6.15 p.m. She was initially alert and oriented. We continued to monitor, and she became a little bit more confused. There was no massive bleeding. Uh, laceration on the scalp had to be used with the hair tie and dressing. Uh, airway and C-spine, we placed her in a soft collar. Nexus was negative, but she had a head injury. Respirations were okay. Circulation was good. Uh, blood pressure uh, was probably at least 80 in view of a radial pulse. We did not have problems with hypo or hyperthermia. Um, in terms of the sample, she had increasing headache, right flank pain, neck stiffness, but no focal neurologic changes, no allergies. Medication-wise, she was on Coumadin, and it turned out her INR three days before the trip was 3.5. She was also taking Toprol. Medical and surgical history were positive for osteoporosis, atrial fib, and DVT. Her last meal was the night before, and she had fallen from six feet onto the back of her head. Remember, 9.8 feet was the limiting factor there. But she had right flank um, pain, so we had concern about head, renal, liver, and um, uh, possible pulmonary trauma in the face of Coumadin, and also possible rib fractures in view of her osteoporosis, although she had no shortness of breath. Uh, colder for pain. Uh, pain was getting somewhat worse. Physical exams showed no neuro changes, but increasing confusion. Uh, she had point tenderness over the 10th, 11th, and 12th rib on the right. No frank hematuria. Vital showed an increased heart rate of 110 despite her toprol, but it was regular. We made the decision to evacuate by helicopter as soon as possible, especially since we were worried about being able to fly later in the day. There was no cell coverage. We knew because of pre-trip planning that a radio was present at a lodge 1.5 miles away. So at sunrise, we sent three hikers with information. The remainder stayed to uh, keep an eye on the patient. Uh, an area for helicopter landing was cleared and marked with an X. She underwent transport to the hospital. Remember, we're up in Canada and uh, we had driven from the States. So you needed to be sure to send her passport with her. Uh, long and the short of it, her imaging brain was okay. She had multiple rib fractures, no renal or liver damage, but CAT scan of her lung showed a hematoma on the right. She was treated at the hospital in Canada, released several days later to her husband's care with a diagnosis of concussion rib fractures, and pulmonary hematoma. There were no sequelae, and she's been hiking with us on a number of occasions since then. Uh, we divvied up her uh, stuff and uh, hiked that back out a couple of days later. So in summary, keep in mind that in these cases, you need to keep in mind CIDO, safety, initial evaluation, detailed evaluation, ongoing treatment and reevaluation, and always remember that good adventure favors the prepared. So be prepared and then have fun out there. This concludes uh, today's lecture. I thank you for the privilege of your time. And at this point, I'd be willing to answer questions. So if you have any questions, thank you very much, doctor. It was very informative. Appreciate all of that. Kara, do you have any questions that have been sent in? Maybe Kara isn't there. Maybe Tim. 
Nope, I'm checking right now. No questions in the chat box at the moment. Okay. So let me ask you about satellite phones because uh, in my tour of Yukon this uh, this summer, there was no satellite to hook the phone up to. So yeah, uh, exactly, and and that can be a problem for people, which is why you know sometimes you just have to do it the old-fashioned way that I'm old enough we used to always have to do, and that is carry a paper map, mark your location on the map, hike out three people in case one is hurt, one can stay with them, one can continue on and then stay where you say you're going to be. Don't move, you know, search and rescue. You end up going to find somebody and they're supposed to be at point A and they've decided, well, let's move to point B instead. And then you're flailing around trying to figure out where the heck they move to so that you can uh, decide where to go next. Uh, so yeah, sometimes you just have to do it the old fashioned way, walk. And that's why it's important to know where your evacuation points are. And on a long trip, I do a lot of long distance backpacking, you know, two, three weeks worth of backpacking. So we usually try and set a middle evacuation point. So if you get into trouble partway through, you've got a way out like that guy that was having TIAs. Um, but also some places you just, the Coast Guard, like a lot of coastal hikes, the Coast Guard can only get in to certain places. So you need to know where those are. Or if you're having a problem, you can't be where the high tide's going to come and get you. And if you have to get somebody up a ladder, that's not a good situation. So you may have to backtrack. And so having those ideas in the back of your mind ahead of time uh, really is helpful so you're not trying to do it on the fly. Uh, the other thing that I, I tend to see is that people want to take a, a medical kit containing everything but the ICU monitoring system. And, uh, you know, they only have so much space and they only have so much weight that you can carry. And I was wondering if you might want to review, again, I know you listed a list of things there, uh, I mean, I, I, I bring duct tape wherever I go. You but, know, me uh, too. I always bring duct tape. Um, I always bring aspirin because a lot of the people I hike with are old like me. Um, and um, I always bring line because you can't make line in the wilderness. You know, most other stuff you can take a stick or, you know, find this or that that you can make do with. But those things, I just can't, you know, you can't make line very easily. Um, so those are, the, I have one friend that's an ER doc and all he takes is a roll of duct tape, a SAM splint and a bottle of aspirin. And he's fine, but we were on a trip one time with him and he had problems and those three things didn't help. And so I had to rummage around in my stuff for things. Um, I tend to probably overkill it on the medication end, uh, whereas ER docs are more minimalists, I think, but they're also used to dealing with trauma and those kinds of things every day, whereas I'm not. So it, I would say it depends on your level of comfort and where are you going? Like I bicycle to work all the time and back. I bicycle on roads, granted backcountry roads, but roads. I don't bicycle in the woods. So what I carry on my bike bag is an ace wrap, a bottle of aspirin, and uh, that's essentially it. Now that one slide I showed where with the arm, that was me on a bike ride on a back road where somebody's pit bull and Rottweiler got out. I ride a recumbent. And so they came for the throat and all I had time to do was this. And so I got this and this. And so having a few band-aids and an ace wrap did okay, but 
you know, it probably would have been better to have a little bit better dressing along with me on the bike ride. And then, you know, in those kind of circumstances, think about whether they've had the rabies vaccine or not. Well, these stupid dogs didn't have the rabies vaccine. So that opened a whole can of worms, you know. Tim, anything? What? Another I have thing. one additional question. Yeah, go ahead. Sure. Yeah. Hey there. Uh, thank you so much for the lecture. I, I, I love hearing um, things just like aspirin or just like a splint or just anything along those lines are so good. Being in the military, I know they uh, right now are trying to promote things like uh, ultrasounds, you know, so you're going into long distances of carrying them on the go. You know how they're getting smaller and smaller each day. Do you see in the foreseeable future of ultrasound being more handy um, or have you had experience yourself recently of, you know, yeah, you know things like ultrasounds? I know the wilderness medicine group, a lot of them on longer trips and the mm -hmm. military, or, you know, you're going to be in on a stair environment for a long period of time. will do that kind of stuff. And they're working on, you know, miniaturizing. Um, you know, for the most part, the longest backpacks I do are about three weeks. I'm not out for months at a time. Right. Um, so yeah, as they get smaller and smaller, but the thing is, so now you do an ultrasound and, and you found something, what are you going to do with it Absolutely. when you're 90 miles from nowhere, you know? Right. So, so I don't know. I think um, the military may make you take that, uh, the course that I mentioned on the, uh, oh, I forget the name of it. Bear with it's me. Probably will. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, and it's a good course. It's tactical casualty emergency care. Oh, that definitely sounds like military would give us that. Yeah, I, I think that they're going to um, plan on teaching that for everybody. And they also uh, have a civilian version of that. Um, I think it's about a week long course, though. And so, you know, a lot of these courses, like even the um, uh, AWLS course is a two day course. Well, most people can take two days out of their life to do that kind of thing. But when you're non-military to take a week or some of those austere medicine courses, those are a couple of months. Right. Uh, long. Um, you know, it's kind of like, how long do you want to be out there? Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I, I, it sounds like uh, tactical casualty emergency care is going to be required for most military folks. And, you know, person, uh, are you in the wilderness medicine society at all? I am not, no. Uh, person, you might want to look up, uh, look at their website, but there's a guy that uh, named Ian Wedmore, W-E-D-M-O-R-E, -E, um, who just is retiring from the Air Force, but he was big into ultrasound and long-term uh, austere medicine, like up in uh, Arctic or Antarctic or, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, and they were doing a lot of ultrasound stuff along with Jay Lemery, who's also from, uh, Wilderness Medicine Society. And he run, Jay Lemery runs the, uh, Wilderness Medicine, uh, fellowship mm -hmm. now at, uh, Colorado, I think. Yeah. So two people from WMS that you might, and, and they're very, uh, nice about emailing you back and, and answer questions we Thank have you. a well i'm sorry dr arthur go right ahead oh no not to worry actually i was i'm, I'm pretty sure we're about to point out the same thing about the um the, the article yep that's what i was the, just the, yep yep <laughs> <laughs> so so uh mary we have a request from uh melinda moore asking if you could just uh provide the information again on the article on osteopathy uh uh in the wilderness yeah hold on let me find it here Thank you, Dr. Arthur. Yeah, no, not to worry. Okay, here we go. Okay, so it's by Brunius, B-R-U-N-E-U-S at Al. 
and it's called Osteopathy in the Back Country. And it's in Wilderness and Environmental Medicine 2021, volume 38, issue number four. And if you can't find that, uh, let Tim know and I can pull it up. I think it's open. A lot of their articles are open uh, season. If you just Google them, you can find the article. But if for some reason that's not, let me know, uh, let Tim know, and then I can uh, go into the Wilderness Medical Society journal and almost I can just all, lift it yeah, out of there. All, uh, colleges, almost all colleges and university libraries can access almost everything. So okay. if you get the right, the right uh, designation should be yeah, able but to that, that was a real good explanation of all kinds of different things like for uh counter strain for plantar fasciitis and trapezial spatum inhibitory pressure uh same for headache and myofascial release for lumbar spasm and those are things that you know you're not only going to get in hikers and backpackers you're going to find them in kayakers and cyclists i don't cave and i don't scuba um, so I don't know about those kinds of things, but, uh, also, uh, I don't know if there's anybody here that's interested in, um, aerospace medicine, but, um, uh, Dr. Polk, P-O-L-K is, uh, very much into wilderness medicine in space and he is a DO. Yeah. JD is a member. So... I want to thank you, uh, Mary. It was a very uh, informative and different from what we've had in the past, but that's okay. This is a type of information that students have been looking for. And, and uh, if nothing else, remember to take the duct tape. <laughs> okay. So, uh, and uh, while I've got you all, um, it's old and outdated now, but there is a free uh, climate and health lecture that I did for ACOI that should be you should be able to access if you're interested in that topic. And um, also uh, the Yakima School is doing a lot more climate and health lectures. So uh, for you students there that are in different places it might behoove you to to start bugging your uh, professors to start including climate and health in there. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I'll put in a pitch for climate and health. <laughs> that That's okay. It, it, we all live in it. That's so I thank everybody tonight. Uh, it's eight o'clock and time uh, to stay on time. So wish everybody well. Have a great Thanksgiving.